When it comes to pre-recorded music formats, I've got a piece of equipment that's capable of playing back most of the regular ones at a fairly decent quality now. Whether it's a vinyl record, a compact disc, a compact cassette, and then on into things that are perhaps a bit less common, like open reel tape and eight track, and then mini disc and DCC, the list goes on. But there is one fairly large hole in that list and I intend to sort that out now because I realise I haven't got anything that's capable of playing back 78 RPM shellac records at a decent quality that I could archive those records using. By that I mean I've got things that will play back a 78 RPM shellac record. I've got the HMV 102 for example but that's an acoustic player and if I wanted to record the audio from it I'm dangling a microphone down in front of the the horn that's in the back of the case and it's very hard with that piece of equipment to get the speed exactly right for playing back a record. So I've got other devices that could play 78s, but none of them are of a decent quality. So I think it's time to sort that out. I've made it my mission to try and put together a decent 78 RPM record player at the minimum cost. It doesn't have to be the best one on the market, just one that I could record the output from if I ever get a 78 that I want to save the audio off. So let me show you how I got on with that. Unsurprisingly, there aren't many companies out there making good quality 78 RPM record players nowadays at a sensible price. The Riga Planar 78 is one that I've seen recommended though. It only plays 78 RPM records and that £400 price doesn't include the appropriate cartridge. That would be another £80. So at £480 all in, perhaps it's something more for the serious user rather than a casual one like myself who only owns a handful of 78s. A cheaper alternative would be the Audio-Technica ATLP120, that's a three-speed turntable and it costs around £250. To this though you'd need to add a 78 RPM cartridge like their VM95SP at £70. And so that that could be easily swapped in and out it might be a good idea to mount that onto a second head shell which would only cost you another £20. So that one all in costs around £340, still not exactly cheap but £140 cheaper than the Riga and it could play 45s and LPs as well. So if you didn't already have a record player in the house I think that would be a good option that covered all the bases. Now at this point there might be some people out there watching this, well hopefully there are, but some of the people watching this might be thinking why don't I just go ahead and get one of those little suitcase record players? They're often advertised as being able to play three different speeds of records, so why don't I just go and get my 78 RPM Schlatt records, put it on one of those, record the output from there. Well you could, I mean it'll play what's on them, but it's not going to do it at a good enough quality not just because it's one of those little cheap mechanisms and all that kind of stuff and it's a ceramic cartridge it's more to do with the fact that it's the wrong type of stylus I'll explain when the LP came out it was advertised as the micro groove record I don't know if you can see that at the bottom of the label there long playing micro groove the reason they said micro groove is because the groove on the new 33 to thirds were narrower than the groove had been on the 78s that went before. The micro groove is a one mil groove. Now by mil I'm not meaning millimeters, I'm meaning a thousandth of an inch. So it uses a groove that's a thousandth of an inch. Typically on a 78 RPM you're looking at, you'd probably need a a stylus that can fit in a, a three mil groove so it's three times the width. I mean there were different widths of 78s. I mean it was a format that was around for a long time and lots of different people were making them but basically the groove on your average 78 rpm shellac records is three times the width of the groove on a 33 and a third record. So these little suitcase record players that use the same stylus for 45s, 33s and 78s, it's fine on 45s and 33s, get up to 78s, the stylus is too narrow, it's a 1mm stylus in a 3mm groove. Let me just try and show you what the problem is. Right, you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit here now, but I'm going to use this gatefold album cover to represent the groove on a record. Uh, this is the groove on a 78 RPM record. Uh, this red card represents the stylus traveling along that groove okay now in reality the walls of this canyon go in and out and that's the audio that gets picked up 
here, the stylus is bouncing around, those vibrations travel up and that's what you're listening to. So this is a three mil stylus here, okay? I'm gonna keep the groove the same width, but as you can see here, it's touching both walls nice and easily. Now, let's get the piece of card here that's around about a third of the width of that. In fact, it's a little bit over, so I'm being a bit generous here. But this is equivalent to a one mil stylus traveling in a three mil groove. And look what happens. It's right down the bottom. It's not even it in the sides. It's, it's scraping along the bottom where there's gonna be a small amount of audio, really. Your grooves bouncing in and out here, and then down at the bottom, you really kind of get the dregs of the audio, and you're also scraping along the bottom of this valley. And uh, what's happening is you're just getting a load of surface noise, and your actual audio is going to be at a lower level in comparison to that surface noise, and it's just going to sound terrible. That's what's going to happen. So, yeah, it can reproduce the sounds, but it's not the right equipment for the right job, is the long and short of it. Now, I do happen to have one of these style of mechanisms here. Uh, this is a similar kind of thing that you get in one of those suitcase record players. It can play all three speeds using the same stock stylus. It's one of those ceramic cartridges with a little plastic cantilever sapphire stylus. So the quality from this is going to be roughly the same as you get out of one of those suitcase things. So let's have a listen to a 78 RPM record played back through this. Oh, just one thing to mention, I'm going to be playing you back some music from this particular record because when I did the review of the HMV 102, I uploaded a playlist of 78s that I'd played on that, and there were only a couple of them that didn't hit a content match. This was one of those, and the other one didn't really sound that great anyway because it was a bit worn out. Now, there was one record that didn't hit a match, but I've seen other people upload it, and theirs has done for the same recording, but played back on better equipment. So it's possible that this might hit a match when I start playing it back on decent equipment rather than an acoustic device that's perhaps playing at the wrong speed. If that happens, I'm gonna to have to snip the audio up a little bit during this video. I won't know until I upload the whole thing at the end, but if you see any silent bits in this video, or perhaps sections where I've had to just play little tiny snippets of audio rather than a big long stretch, that's the reason why. I do think it's rather misleading and more than a little bit cheeky for the manufacturers of devices like this to have that 78 switch on there because it is implying that this device is totally fine for playing back 78s and they never say anywhere by the way if you want to play 78s you'll need to change the stylus and as a result when you look under the questions on amazon someone will be asking oh, do you need a different stylus for 78s? And everyone's like, oh, no, no, you don't, no, no. These things will play all three speeds. You don't need to change the stylus. So yeah, as a result of this kind of stuff, the information's got rather muddled. And therefore, people who listen to 78s on these are getting a pretty poor experience. And they're associating that with the quality of the records. They're thinking 78s sound like that. 78s sound all terrible, even in mint condition, when in reality, they're just playing it back on the wrong equipment. And it could sound a lot better if they had the right equipment. And talking of equipment, you might recognize these. This is a flip over stylus, something that was common in the days when people had three speed record players and they had a collection of 78s and they were getting their new 45s and LPs as well. So if they wanted to play their new records, they'd flip the stylus one way. Whereas if they wanted to play their old collection of 78s, they'd flip it the other. For the modern records, it would usually have a one mil diamond stylus, whereas for the 78s, it would have a three mil, more often than not, sapphire stylus. Of course, people buying things like this aren't really looking for the high end, and neither am I. I wanted something that was capable of playing them back with a proper moving magnet cartridge and a decent quality with the right size stylus, but you know, a step up from this, but I'm not going into your kind of super audio file stuff. So I was looking for something in that kind of middle budget ground and second hand 
looking on the forums, one turntable that got mentioned quite a bit was the Thorin's TD-180. Now, this was a budget record player. It had the Thorin's name on it, but it wasn't manufactured by them. It was manufactured by a company in Poland for them. They just badged it up. So it wasn't a high quality device, but it is capable of playing back all three speeds. And it has a normal head shell that you can swap over to a proper 78 compatible stylus and cartridge. So it seems like the right kind of thing for me, and they don't cost too much either. The trouble is they do suffer from a few technical issues. People have issues with the speed on them and various other problems, but if you can get a decent working one, it's probably what I'm looking for. Other than that, the other stuff just seemed very expensive. So of course I went looking on eBay to see if I could find one. Now, bear in mind that this was a budget model from the early 1990s, and I think that the Thorin's name here is making people assume that its price should reflect that. It's definitely not a £250 record player, this one, though. For that money, you'd be better off with that brand new Audio Technica. I managed to get mine at a far more sensible price, £44.99, including delivery. From the pictures, it looked to be in good condition, and unusually for this model, didn't have a cracked or missing lid. It was still a bit of a gamble though, it came from a house clearance, didn't have its power supply and was untested. Still for that price I decided to take the gamble. The seller packed it well and it arrived with the lid still intact. The arm had been secured sensibly, however the turntable was out of position and at first glance looked like something might have been broken. Fortunately it had all just shifted out of position, it was simple to relocate it back in place and everything appeared undamaged. OK, so here we are a week later. My power supply has arrived. It's a third party one, but it's been marked up as for this range of turntables. So it's the right voltage, UK plug. So it should, in theory, go through there and it doesn't. Right, well, that fits now. Let's see if this thing powers on. OK, here we go. Yeah, action at last. Bit of dust on this now, but it's running at a fair speed. Is that 78 RPM? I don't know. Right, so let's use the RPM app on the phone and pop that on the middle there and see if this is getting up to 78. It's running at 73.92, which is 5.23% slower than it should be. I wonder what it's like at the other speeds. Let's uh, reset this and start again. Yeah, that one has stopped at 32.43, so 2.72% slow. Right, so that has frozen at 42.9, which is nearly 5% slow again. So yeah, the whole thing's running slow. I think what I'll do, I'll leave it running at 78 RPM for 15 minutes or so, and then come back and see if it's altered its speed at all. And the answer's no. I can see straight away on there. Yeah, we're about 6% slow. Let's just have a look under here. Now, I believe that this is how it regulates its speed. There's a photo sensor there, and this is a light that's shining through this disc. And as this rotates, that tells it what speed it's going. And I believe that these can be a bit dim. I wonder if I was to shine a brighter light down through there, if that would improve things. Yeah, no difference at all, so I can forget that idea. I think this requires a little bit more investigation. Now, I do trust the RPM app, but just in case, for whatever reason, it was getting the wrong measurements, I thought I should also test the speed with my strobe disc. The trouble is, these rely on an incandescent bulb, something that plugs into the power supply, and in this case, would flicker at 50 hertz. Turns out, don't have a single incandescent bulb in the house. Now you can get kits with a strobe disc and a handheld battery powered light, which will flicker at the right frequency, but those are really rather expensive. But I did manage to find a chap in the UK who was selling his own homemade little flashy box thing for just 20 pounds. So I got hold of one of those. If it's running at the correct speed, these circular blocks should look like they're not moving. We're looking at the innermost of the three outer rings, and the fact that the blocks on this one are moving to the right shows that this 78 RPM mode is running slow. Moving the speed control to 45 RPM, now looking at the middle ring, that shows the same problem, it's moving to the right. And then finally, moving it to 33 and a third, the same issue affects that one. It's all running slow. So, 
Now we know it's running slow and it's running slow at all three speeds. What's the problem? What's causing that? Well, it's not a slipping belt. If that was happening, it would be adjusting its speed. It would be going up and down. It's staying consistently at the same speed, but at the wrong speed. And the fact it's happening at all three speeds means that it's not just like a little pot that's out of trim somewhere because all three are being affected similarly. All I could think of was that perhaps it's to do with capacitors. It's always capacitors, isn't it? So there are people selling cap kits on eBay for this particular turntable. It has issues that are known to be ones that you can fix by replacing the caps. Not the issue that I'm having, but I was thinking, well, let's give it a go. Let's swap the caps out and see if that sorts out the problem. I've got the kit because it's literally all I can think of doing now at this point. Right, let's have a look. Okay, so apparently I'm replacing that with that. This goes over here, and that one replaces that one. First off, it says just snip the legs on these. That's really snipped off low, that one. I doubt I'll be able to solder to that. It didn't snip off very well at all. I might end up just taking this out. I was hoping not to do this, but here we go. Okay, so I've turned on the desoldering tool. A couple of people asked me about this when I used it last time in a video. Just a cheap one, cheapest I could get. So the idea is you set your temperature on the front. That's the temperature on the front of the soldering iron. There's a tiny hole in the middle of there. Don't know if that comes across on camera. Let's just focus it like that. And therefore you pop that on the thing, heat the solder up, press the trigger, sucks the solder into this chamber here, and then you empty that when you're finished. I'll try to zoom you in a little bit, but the angles on this are terrible. So just a reminder, those two there at the top, right, let's take that one out. Let the solder heat up and then suck it away. There we go, we've got a nice clean hole there. So we'll take that pin out of there. There we go. Probably can't see that, but I've got a little pin out of there. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's fallen out the other side, that one. Yeah, that's not coming off. Let's just pop that back in place then, that board, before we move on to the other side. Now you'll see these pots here, and you might be thinking that I should be twiddling those to try and adjust the speed. But the thing is, if it's out of spec, it's not because somebody's messed with those pots, it's because something's failed. It's not like somebody's opened the bottom of this, adjusted the pots to 5% slow, and then closed it back up again. I've got a new cap there, a new cap there, we just need to go down the other end now. Right, well that's on there as well. Power off. Let's turn this over and see if we can hear a nice big loud bang, followed by me putting it in the wheelie bit. It's spinning. 45. 78. Okay, right, now it's moving, but we don't know if it's moving at the right speed, do we? So. Let's get the strobe out again. Yeah, we're still running slow. Yeah, 73.49 minus 5.78%. And I suppose at this point, the only thing I've got left to do, even though it wasn't what I intended to do, is to mess around with these pots. Okay, I've got it spinning now. I'm gonna see if I can adjust the 78. That's definitely running faster now. Well, let's check that out. Oh, too fast now. All right, move it back a bit. Right, well according to that, that's 78, right? So let's go for 45 now. All right, 33, should be the other one. Okay, so I've took the lights down now, so let's have a look at this. Starting from 33 and a third again. Outside ring, yeah, that's 33 and a third. Middle of the three rings, 45, yeah, that's right. And 78 takes a little bit of time to get up to speed, but there we go. That's right as well. How long it's going to last, I don't know. But it's working at the minute, and that's all I need. I'm not going to take that as a complete win, because I shouldn't have to adjust these pots to get the speed right. Clearly there's something else wrong with this. But by adjusting these three pots, one for 78, one for 33 and a third, one for 45, I've got the speed correct for the moment. So... I'll take that and I'll put the base on and then what I need to do now, I need to go shopping for a 78 RPM cartridge. 
OK, so after a bit of browsing, I decided upon that Audio Technica cart that we looked at earlier. It's got a 3mm stylus on it, so that should be suitable for all the 78s that I'm going to play on this, and it cost me £65. So I ordered that for delivery the next day. But I've just realised I've got a bit of a head of myself, because I've never played anything on this yet. I don't even know if it outputs sound. I haven't untied these cables yet. So I think the next job should be to plug it into a phono preamp and see if this thing can actually play a record with the current cartridge before I go ahead and swap it over to the new one. OK, all wired up, so let's find out if this is a complete waste of time. Thank goodness for that, we've got audio. I suppose that's my celebration music. Right, so we've got it working. And now I just need to swap over this cartridge. Right, okay, we've got the wires off. Now this side's coming off just fine, but unfortunately the other side of this isn't because these are being held on with these little bolts at the bottom. Well, I think that's got it now, yep, okay. Right, so there's my cartridge. There's a little spacer under there. It says 3.0 in there, so presumably 3mm spacer. Yeah, I don't know whether the new cartridge will need that, possibly. Right, so the cartridge has arrived. It's an ATVM 95SP, and it mentions here dual moving magnet cartridge for 78 RPM SP record. So that's exactly what we need. Let's pop it on. Yeah, from looking at that, I'd suggest they're the same depth as one another, so it definitely needs its spacer on there. So we'll pop that back on before we put this on the thing. But I think what we need to do first is to, to get the wires on here. It'll be easier if I do that before I screw this to it. So let's start with that. I've got to be careful with this because it looks like at some point somebody snapped this red wire off because it's a little bit shorter than the other ones. So it's an awkward one to fit. I don't want to snap it off again, so... I'm just taking my time over this. Right, we're on. Let's look at our screw kit. Oh, we've got a long and a short one. Well, I think we'll go for the long ones because we've got that spacer in there, so that makes sense. So we'll take a long one and uh, another one here. Put a washer on it. OK, so with that in place, I've just got to align it now. I've got this little chart here, and the idea is I'll be able to put that on there once I take the cover off here, we can try and get this pretty much straight to the markings on there. It needs a bit of a twist. Yeah, that's following that perfectly and perfectly straight there as well. OK, well, that's about as good as I can get it. Let's tighten this up. OK, so moving on to adjusting the tracking force, according to these specs, you should set that between four and a half and five and a half grams, ideally going for five grams. OK, so I've adjusted the weight as far forward as it will go to produce the maximum amount of tracking force possible. And all I'm getting out of this is just about 4.4-ish. So a little bit under the ideal, but not that far under. It'll do. Adjusting the tracking force got me thinking about that Audio Technica turntable and how a second head shell made it easy to swap the cart over quickly, but you'd also have to remember to adjust the tracking force each time you did it. It's still a great option for 78s, but that's just something else to bear in mind. OK, for those that are still awake, finally it's time to play that record again. This time, though, in a record player with the appropriate size stylus on it and a moving magnet cartridge at the right speed. So let's have a listen. <laughs> I'm going to say that's a success. That is by far the best quality I've ever got out of a 78 RPM record. Of course, there are age-related issues with the records themselves, but as far as getting the best out of them within a limited budget, well, I think I've achieved that. But at this point, perhaps I should say a word about the RIAA equalisation that's applied to the playback of vinyl records whenever they're played through a phono preamp like the one I've got. I'll abridge Wikipedia's summary to explain what this does. 
RIAA equalisation is a form of pre-emphasis on recording and de-emphasis on playback. A recording is made with the low frequencies reduced and the high frequencies boosted, and then on playback the opposite occurs. This system became the standard in 1954, but before then each record company applied its own equalisation and apparently over a hundred combinations of turnover and roll-off frequencies were in use. So it's probably not strictly accurate, but you can think of it as similar to a compression and expansion system. The audio's compressed so it's better suited to putting it on a record, and then the phono preamp expands it out again so it sounds normal. And since this, like most regular preamp, supplies RIAA equalisation on any audio coming out of it, it'll also be doing this to the sound from 78s that either don't need RIAA or will be using a different system. Therefore, the tone of these old records won't sound exactly as it was intended. Now, to resolve this, you could get a specialist preamp that covers a variety of equalizations, but I'm on a budget system here, so my zero-cost alternative is just to adjust the bass and treble, or perhaps to play around with the graphic equalizer settings to compensate. Doing this will get most people close enough to be happy. Now, if you really wanted to get the very best archive quality copy of your 78s, though, well, you shouldn't be doing it with a budget setup like mine. But secondly, you could also apply specific equalizations to recordings you've captured in an audio editing software package such as Audacity. But with all that said, the 78 RPM records I've played so far sound just fine to me without any kind of alteration. I suppose whether you worry about things like this depends upon what kind of listener you are. If back in the day you occasionally played a Dolby B cassette without the noise reduction switched on because it sounded clearer, or if you prefer the sound of things with the mega bass button activated, well, doing any of those things would be altering the sound more significantly than listening to an old 78 with the incorrect equalization so i certainly will not be losing any sleep over this but there are some people who do they'll already be compensated for different eqs for different records and as a result they shouldn't really be looking for expert advice from a bloke with a 45 pound record player just one last thing i need to do here though these are mono records that stylus that cartridge is supposed to be picking up a mono signal but then it's wired in for stereo after there and goes into a stereo phono preamp so the next best thing I thought of is I can get the output of this going into a headphone splitter which has a mono button on it. So I'm waiting for that to come now because when that arrives I'll plug it into this, play it to you in mono and you'll be able to hear the quality that we're getting out of this record. And you might be pleasantly surprised. Okay, so with this, I've now got the last piece of the jigsaw. I can finally play the audio back as it was intended in mono. Now, the reason it's best to listen in mono is because if you don't, you could get weird off-putting phantom stereotype effects like clicks that were only heard through one speaker, for example. In the information about the cartridge and the stylus, Audio Technica say the following about this. They say it's recommended to use the mono on function on your standard stereo phono preamplifier to minimise record surface noise. They also go on to suggest that professional archivers might choose to use the right or left channels or a variable mix of both to get the best possible recording. Now, I can only choose one or the other, and after listening through the record through both, I've chosen to use the audio from the right channel as it seems to have less clicks. So, let's have a listen. And very briefly, just for comparison's sake, let's have another quick listen to the recording that I made with this device.
tend to learn a little bit from every project that I do. It's one of the reasons I like doing these things because you tend to pick something up along the way. I probably wouldn't have gone about this the same way if I started over again, but I think I've got some pretty good results there. It's all very much dependent on the records themselves. I mean, these are quite warm records. They're not in pristine condition. I'm sure if I got some good quality 78s, I'd enjoy even better results. It's a shame I couldn't play you much in the way of audio though, because uh, of course everything's still hitting content matches. For example, I've got some Elvis Presley records that were my parents that they bought in the 1950s. Um, and of course, those have been played a lot, but they do sound really quite good. I might just give you a brief snippet if you don't tell anyone about it. So let's just have a listen. Now, if you heard silence there, that's because I've had to mute that section. But yeah, I thought the vocals came across really well, much better than I'm used to hearing from a 78. And of course, that was a heavily worn record as well. So yeah, there's quite a lot of potential in 78s that we don't tend to tap. Of course, the experts know all this and they've been listening to these records for years on very high-end equipment. I'm really trying to do stuff on the cheap here. Uh, this is not a demonstration of the best way to do it, it's just a demonstration of what I've done to try and get the most low budget but high quality 78 playback. And I'm sure you could do better, you could search around, find better equipment that would be more suitable to you. And this isn't a demonstration of how you should do it, it's just showing what I've done to do this. So I hope you've enjoyed having a look at my experimentation with playing back 78s at a higher quality than you get out of one of those uh, suitcase record players. And hopefully you've noticed a difference. If you were listening through headphones, I'm sure you probably have done. And if you didn't notice a difference, then go ahead, play them on your little suitcase record players. I'm not telling you what to do. It's your life. You get on with it. Right, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.